Welcome to Temple of Health Radio Show. This is Dr. Susan Kolb, and today I'm pleased to have as my guest Neil Kramer, who is the author of The Unfoldment, The Organic Path to Clarity, Power, and Transformation. Uh, Neil is an English writer, philosopher, and spiritual teacher, and uh, he is is uh, knowledgeable about consciousness, metaphysics, and mysticism, and uh, has put a lot of really great ideas into this book, and um, uh, basically is uh, involved in writing, interview interviews, lectures, and uh, does group workshops, and I'm sure he has a website he'll share with us. He currently lives in Oregon, and we're speaking with him today. Thank you very much, Neil, for joining us. I appreciate you uh, giving us an hour of your time. Well, it's a pleasure to join you today. Thank you for inviting me. Well, I did really enjoy your book. It, it's um, it it has a lot of really great, uh, uh, I would say, philosophy, um, information about consciousness, and is really written, I guess, for for the person who is on the path of, as you say, unfoldment, uh, which is a good word for what we're going through, which is really not taking on belief systems, but more letting belief systems go. So, um, yeah, absolutely. You... It, it is. It is very much that, and it's it's addressed to the to the newcomer, but also to the you know, as it were, the old timer who looks at society today and wonders how spirituality and metaphysics and so on fit into it. So yeah, it, it's an effort to address two very different kinds of paths. You know, those who are new, those who have been walking it for some time. So did you um, have a uh, uh... I guess a a thing that happened in your past that put you on the path, or is it something that you've always had an interest in? Yeah, it's a funny question, that isn't it? Because a, a lot of people, you know, they have a some kind of epiphany on a park bench, or they get struck by lightning, or they have a you know <laughs> they get beamed up by UFOs or something, don't they? Right. And then they right. then they then they change their life and they pack the job in and, and write a book or something. For me, mm-hmm. there was none of that, really. It was from the very beginning, I was just a young boy looking around at the world thinking, is that it? Is that it, then, is it? That's everything. And <laughs> science has fathomed all matters and all formulas and all forces of nature, and all the universities have all the knowledge of mankind, do they? And uh, everyone was kind of nodding, saying, well, yeah, essentially, that's the way it is. And I just sort of didn't buy that. And then 10 years later, it was even uh, more suspicious. And 10 years later, it was, you know, highly dubious. And I thought, well, I can just be cynical and just scratch my chin and look around at the world thinking something's not right, or I can actually do something about it. So rather than complain about anything, I decided to go on a, um, you know, a journey of exploration, really, um, which took me into philosophy and mysticism and metaphysics and you know some very esoteric material so um yeah that there's a there's a point certainly where one takes oneself seriously enough to think right i'm actually going to engage with this thing and take a real look at it not just play around the edges and try and be a bit happier and healthier and more balanced but really get to the root of what actually is going on in this place what is it for so that's that's what drives my um thinking and feeling in this world and it's it's the same today as it was when I was fifteen, really. Well, what you know, one of the things that uh, is is interesting about um, some of the material in your book is that you talk about the role of uh, some of the psychedelic plants and the other things that can, you know not doesn't have to be used, but can be used to show the seeker that their construct of reality may not be as solid as they think it is. Because really, it's it's all about knowing that your construct is a construct and that you hold it in place so that you wake up in the same room every morning, that kind of thing. But um, I'm not, you know, advising people to go out and do psychedelic plants or LSD or anything, but... uh, if you ever have a chance to do them, you do realize very quickly that what you consider reality is only one of many choices, and it's not the only reality that that can be experienced. And and you talk yeah, about that. Yeah, that's very true. That's very true, and I think 
it's um, up until that point where you have that deconstruction process happen in your mind, the world seems very solid and concrete and mm-hmm. dependable and consistent. And that really just absolutely comes to pieces with the right sort of um, plant medicine, as, as many indigenous peoples correctly refer to these psychotropic substances. Psychedelics right. really is kind of loaded with Timothy Leary 60. Right. Baggage, yeah. and it's it's <laughs> an, an unhelpful word, isn't it? But that's what most people call it, so we can call it that too. But, um, yeah, certainly for some people, they would never touch such things, and they just think drugs say no and drugs are drugs. But mm-hmm. when you understand that, you know, chocolate has psychotropic properties and, um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, pharmaceutical drugs that you put in your body, uh, all kinds of different things, normal stuff like grass on the ground has dimethyltryptamine in it. You know, there's, there's all kinds of things that alter the chemistry and the, you know, neural pathways in our mind all around us, all kinds of minerals and vegetables that do that. And there are certainly certain ones that help us see something. And it, that seeing in itself isn't particularly um, important or unique or singular but it's the process of changing the way we perceive that is of great value because, it, it, as you said, it makes you realize that the very consistent mainstream consensus reality tunnel, as, as we might call it, is only a very, very slight and a very, very thin sliver of the world. It's not it. It's just a very, very tiny part of it. And so these plant medicines can help you see that. There's lots of other ways through meditation and all kinds of other stuff, but right. um, certainly those those can help. They've not really played a big part on my journey. Um, I sort of have a very open-minded attitude to anything, and certainly I have my experiences with them. But I prefer um, the more organic path to that, which is to be able to do it yourself. And I, I have this intuition that once the plant has shown you how to do it, It's kind of like a teacher. You know, they don't want to sit over your shoulder for the rest of your life. They want Mm -hmm. you to figure out how to do it yourself. So it's it's very much like that for me. Yeah, I I had interviewed um, a number of people coming out of the uh, Carlos Castaneda's um, uh, group. And um, uh, I'm comparing Timothy Leary. Actually, I I had a class with Timothy, Timothy Leary or a workshop with him before he died. But uh, Timothy Leary coined the term reality tunnel, and, and you pointed that out in your book. That was, that's a very good uh, concept yeah, very to, to start talking about this. And then the shamans um, teach that we have an assemblage point and that when a shaman is able to move the student's assemblage point, which I think Don Juan did by kicking them kind of in the in the, uh, in the the aura or whatever you want to call it, the golden egg, he just – you just come over and and tap them on the back, and then their reality would shift. Um, but that that to me was the best material I read about that we really do have the ability to change that assemblage point. So, it, you know, we can be in normal reality like we are now talking on the phone, but um, if something else happens, we could be in a near death experience, which is a different assemblage point. We could be in um, uh, some of the very strange realities that the Carlos Castaneda's material describes. You know, it's where 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 you're um, in other dimensions. So it's really uh, yeah, it, it was yeah. exciting to me to discover that 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 was because I I did experience things. Um, my really my whole life where I think my assemblage point was not quite as stable as it should have been. <laughs> so I I would uh, I would pop out of my body, you know, when I was four and five and, and fly around the house and then pop back in, you know. It was it was just something that I knew how to do and nobody taught it to me because I, I wasn't old enough to take those instructions yet. So well, like you're it. very fortunate because a, a lot of people struggle with that. So if you have a natural uh, facility for that, that that's a definite kind of um, bonus. And I, I think that's really what Castaneda in the, in the 70s was tapping into, which was a very exciting suggestion to people in a very sort of politically flat and rubbish industrial decade to say, look, this isn't it. There's something deeper going on in the background. 
And although many spiritual and mystical students have known that for thousands and thousands of years, we forget it consistently and regularly. We forget that, and we mistake this suggestion of a reality, which isn't even our own, for the real thing. As, as I say in the book, we confuse the map with the terrain, the two different things. Right. And Castaneda, admittedly in a quasi-fictional manner, uh, mm-hmm. took this Mesoamerican uh, Toltec shamanic tradition, synthesized it, I think, into the real and the unreal, which is okay, mm-hmm. and, you know, it excited people's imagination. And that that's what also has been appealing to me in that in my work, my um, mystical heritage, if you like, from being from England is, is European. So um, a lot of mysticism uh, that has informed indigenous shamanic practices all over the world, in my view, a lot of it stems from ancient Europe. And so studying the texts and the practices and the techniques that come out of Europe you find that even these Indian and Chinese and South American practices can be seen as relatively new when you go back far enough. But it's very esoteric history there, so you won't really come across that in Wikipedia or in the history books. Mm -hmm. But it's very exciting because what it means is that lots of our forefathers, lots of our ancestors have also felt that and said, there is something magical happening here very very real in fact it's more real than this and it's right there into penetrating the whole thing it's like the template all the time and if you just shift your perceptions a little bit you can interact with it then you bring in all kinds of you know remarkable stuff into your life like manifestation attraction synchronicity uh, a sense of truth what is true what is untrue you know you get that happiness just plain Mm -hmm. old happiness increases uh, you know, and you get a sense of fulfillment in knowing what is really occurring in this world. And that's very valuable today because it, you know, you, particularly with you and your audience being perhaps concerned in particular with health, it mm-hmm. brings tremendous uh, mental and emotional uh, well being as well, as well as the spiritual and the paranormal elements, if you like. Just the simple flesh and bones health and well-being and centeredness and balance and satisfaction with oneself and one's environment, that increases tenfold. So in writing this book, I've been very conscious to pin down all this kind of abstract thinking into real hands-on experience, because without that, it has no meaning for me. So all the time, it's infused into what's around us, because it is uh, a very integrated practice, this unfoldment and there are elements of awakening and enlightenment and whatnot, but the the treatment of it is one as a process, not as a magic moment that happens, but it's a process that lasts your whole life, and it's a very enjoyable one. Um, you were talking earlier about the um, European uh, influence on other parts of the world. It reminds me of... Uh, some things that are in a book that a friend of mine wrote, Trish McKinnon wrote a book on Jesus, the early years. Um, I can't remember the whole title of the book. It's a Hampton Road book, but it's a real long title. But essentially the book describes the years between 8 and 33, and, you know, where they realized that Jesus, um, when, when he was over in Ireland, and I think he got mad at somebody and the kid dropped dead, they realized they needed to get him into mystery school. So he ended up going in mystery schools in India, Egypt, and in Ireland. And I don't think, and, you know, this book is historically um, documented, so you know, the academic Christians are, are not, um, you know, can't really question it. So basically, even back in Jesus' time, the mystery schools were intact, and they were multicultural, you see. And that 